Welcome to the Bookly Podcast, the first remote podcast that we've done so far. And so hopefully this goes smoothly, because if this goes well, then I think we're going to keep this going. Honestly, I think that we're going to keep this rocking and rolling here if, if this works. So that'd be nice. Anything? Can, are you there? Me? Yeah, I can hit. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I just I, can't. You say we're going to keep this rolling. I'm like, how many books do you want me to read? I mean, one <laughs> one a week, right? Aren't you going to keep on pace? <laughs> this was. I've a, read two this month. This was a long. So that's pretty good. This was a long book. I will say that. Out of all of the books, man, I keep just having to adjust these. Out of all of the books that I've read recently, this is the. This is the longest one that I've had. Um, no, because you read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I mean, this year. Sorry, I'm I'm way out of it right now because I'm, oh, I'm yeah. looking. I'm goofing around with too many different things right now. When it, when it's just two people sitting across from each other, it's easy. But now I'm like goofing around with yeah. all these buttons. I've got a computer right here in front of me. I've got this little doohickey. I've got my phone. Um, no, yeah. Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, I think, is the the longest book that I've read so far in my entire life. Um, but this is the biggest book that I've read this year because, like, last year, I mean, last week's book was Animal Farm. That's, like, 130 pages. I mean, that one's so quick. Although next week, I think, beats this one if I finish it. I'm a little worried because next week Which is, one's next week? It is Crime and Punishment. That's a big one. I don't know. How long is it? It's about twice as long as this book. Yikes. Yeah, it's long. Hopefully it'll be a little bit, I don't know. Hopefully it'll be entertaining. We'll see. But I feel like the sweet spot is like eight hours because. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like anything longer than that, you're kind of like, oh gosh, this is a long book. Anything shorter than that is like, oh, like it was good. I, I wish it would have gone a little bit more in depth on X. Like, honestly, I I can't even think of one more thing that I would want to know about the Comanches after reading this. Like, I feel like it was pretty long winded and very thorough. Yeah, so, yeah. I feel like eight hours is good because this one's like fourteen. Yeah, this book was long, and and I agree with that. I feel like it honestly was almost too long. Um, there were parts of the book that I felt like dragged, but just to introduce the book this week. So this week's book is empire of the summer moon. (laughs) Sorry, Blake there for a quick sec. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the description for people who have not heard about this book, but it is, um, empire of the summer moon spans two astonishing stories. The first traces the rise and fall of the Comanches, the most powerful Indian tribe in American history. The second entails one of the most remarkable narratives ever to come out of the Old West, an epic saga about a pioneer woman, Cynthia Ann Parker, and her mixed blood son. I don't want to say. What? 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 Quana. Quana. Yeah, that's Quana. Quana. Who becomes the last great, uh, the last and greatest chief of the Comanches. So. That's the book. Um, I've heard about this book quite a bit on other people's... Well, I've heard about this book a lot on Joe's podcast. Really, Joe Rogan. He has some sort of fascination with the Comanches in general. And so that's what kind of initially got me to read this book. Had you heard of this book before? Yeah. I, I listen to a few different podcasts that get into like Native American history and and the way that they hunted and all that kind of stuff. So I have heard of this one and a couple of other ones that are on my list, but this was the this was probably the biggest one that I had wanted to read. Okay. I just hadn't gotten around to it. I didn't even know how long it was before I looked on it. Yeah. Maybe if I knew how long it was, I wouldn't have <laughs> had it so high on my list, but but honestly, I really liked it, but you really don't like long books that much. There's, it's just like, I don't know. Like, this is way off topic, but like, let's watch anime. 
but I will never start One Piece because it's so like I don't want to <laughs> take that much time of my life to invest into a story that I'm sure is really good, but just like I just don't have that time. So it's definitely not to the extent of say One Piece, but yeah, like things that are really really long for me are a little hard to invest into because. Like I want to finish things, and I do a lot of different hobbies and whatnot. I just don't have a lot of time to throw at leisure, watching shows or movies and stuff. And so, I like things that are pretty quick, just because I can fit it into my busy schedule. But yeah, I kind of get that. But at the same time, I feel like this isn't that. This isn't that long, right? I mean, no, no, it's definitely not. 56 hours or whatever the third Reich is. I kind of like, I agree with your sweet spot. I think the sweet spot is somewhere around eight hours, but I would say eight to 12 hours is kind of my sweet spot. Anybody, anything in there is really what I like. Anything longer Mm -hmm. gets a little bit, I don't know, I start to zone in and out. But really eight to 12 hours is a good, a good book for me. So I thought this was, I thought this was good. I don't know. What was your overall impression of the book? Did it live up to the hype? You said this was one of the books on your to read list that you were excited for. Did you like it? Uh, yeah. In a lot of ways, I loved it. And then in some ways, I was kind of like bored in a couple of different places just because, like you said, it dragged. Like, honestly, when you're detailing a lengthy history, especially about like, native american wars or the indian wars in america like man it just gets repetitive and it all ends the exact same way right like they (laughs) they ran up on them at night set some stuff on fire killed a bunch of people scalped a bunch of people and both sides left with less people and then that carried on for like 40 years so it's like I understand why it went into detail on all of these different raids and things, but like me personally, I was more interested in more of like their customs as well as like the lengthy history rather than like the minute details of every raid. And, you know, as they're getting into like the latter part of Quanta Parker's kind of reign over... Oh, man, I'm going to forget the... uh, The, like, the group that he was over. It was, like... Yeah, the subgroup of Comanches. But, like, when he was in charge of them, like, he went into so much detail of, like, okay you know, the army ran up this canyon to this river and then over across to this river, across this great plain, and then shared a bunch of journal stories. And like, it was awesome. But like 13 hours of that, it got very repetitive in certain areas. So I think it does live up to the hype, but also I wasn't warned about the, repetitive nature of the story and so that kind of and it's gruesome and so there were times multiple times in this book where i literally had to just like hit pause and be like okay i can't listen to any more of this today because like it's just mutilations and scalpings for four hours or whatever yeah that i will definitely say this book is not for the faint of heart so like if you are squeamish uh, squeamish at all or you don't do well with like violence especially like against kids and women um the comanches were kind of notorious for the violence against kids and women i mean even babies like six week old babies and so like if that's something that doesn't sit well with you um or, you know, kind of disturbs you at a, at a much deeper level. I mean, I think it should disturb everybody at a, at a pretty deep level, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's super messed up, but, um, 
But then, yeah, this book is definitely not for you. Like it is, it is a heavy, heavy, heavy book. And I would agree with exactly what you said. I think I was a little bit disappointed that, that it didn't dive deeper into like their customs, their rituals, a little bit more about like their, their beliefs in general. And instead, um, basically was just a historical account of battles, if that makes sense, which I guess is, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that is what the Comanches are like known for, but it just moved almost too chronological for me. You know, like I, I don't want to be lost in a story. So I like that it was chronological. I hate when things bounce around too much, but it was, it was too chronological, if that makes sense. And I know that that's kind of like a mm-hmm. weird, a weird criticism, but I was, I was kind of hoping for more. And there were pieces of their history that like the they brushed over really, really quick that I was a little bit sad for. So like the book starts off, I mean, it is the title of the book is the rise and fall of the Comanche. So it starts off very early on in the history, which I thought was way too brushed over because it like mentions very, oh, it mentions very cool. quickly that the Comanches were originally a very small tribe out of like the wind river uh, Wyoming area. And then the moment that they discovered horses for the first time, they just blew up. Essentially they, they were the first Indian nation to really embrace horses more than just food. So a lot of people actually kill a lot of the native Americans actually killed horses for like just to eat the meat and you know, hides and pelts and all, all sorts of things. But Comanches were like the first ones to really like grab hold of the fact that you could ride them and use them to your advantage. And so because of that, it was, I mean, he mentions very, very briefly that it was just a very swift change from, you know, small, physically, even I would say, I don't know what the word is. They were inferior. Yeah, physically. Like physically inferior to... Like they were smaller, they were shorter, they were the slower. Tribes. Yeah, like they. He, he even goes into all that. And then they adopted this new tactic with horses and then went from like low on the totem pole of Native Americans to, you know, running the show. Like it was them. And they got whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Mm-hmm. And so that part was the part that, I mean... The book is 13, 14 hours, right? Something like that. I think he talks about that for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Like maybe 10 minutes. Like it, it that was yeah. like that was disappointing to me because I really wanted to know a little bit more about who the Comanches were before. And like I mean, maybe it's a history thing. Like there wasn't a whole lot of written history. It was mostly just like stories passed down. Uh, from generation to generation. So maybe it's just lost and we'll never really know. But that, that to me was a little disappointing early on in the book. Yeah. I, I also like, I get, obviously like you can't cover it in this book. So there's another book that I want to read about uh, the Comancheros and all of like Coronado's men and their whole expedition up because they were really the first people to contact the Plains Indians um, because everything prior to that was East Coast, right? So they, like, Leif Erikson and um, Christopher Columbus, like, they all they all met the Indians that were along the coastline, specifically, you know, the East Coast, uh, Cook, met some of the ones on the West coast, but the Plains Indians in particular, but like hadn't really had Western exposure up until Coronado's expedition. And Coronado was the guy who introduced the horses into North America after the North American horse went extinct. Right. So part of the reason why the Comanches were so good at, whooping up on the old American boys is because the Spanish horses were faster and better than the, um, than like the Western European horse that they brought over and were using in America at the time. Cause it was more of like an agriculture horse than it was like a free ranging horse. So anyways, he, he talks about that for like 10 minutes, but like, 
again, I, I would have wanted to know a little bit more about, you know, the horses themselves or I get like, it almost felt like there was five minutes of him talking about, um, basically how the Comanches went from a nobody to all of a sudden everybody in the plains was afraid of the Comanches. Like growing up, I always heard like, okay, the Apaches, those were, yeah, those were the dudes. Yeah. Right. Just because they were big, but the right? Apaches were like the whipping post of the Comanches <laughs> basically. Yeah. I'm like, how have I, I, I hadn't even really heard about the Comanches. Like, no, honestly, what was your, yeah, it's just, it's what was crazy. your education level of native American history outside of reading things recently? Cause I know you've kind of gotten into it. You started with like American Buffalo and then, you know, you've like gotten mm -hmm. a little bit more and more into that history side of things, but pre you discovering it by yourself, what was your, what was your exposure to American history, like Amer native American history? Um, growing up in Alaska, I feel like we kind of have a skewed view of it a little bit because every time we learned about native Americans, it was like that much native Americans. And then all of it was native Alaskan. So I like, we grew up with tons of exposure to native Alaskan heritage, but man, other than like the trail of tears and, uh, Lewis and Clark and like the very, very beginnings of, um, like the American settlement, basically nothing. I, I knew nothing about the Plains Indians or because, yeah, Plains Indians and even west of that, like the Northwest tribes and everything like that. It was like nothing. I, I never heard anything about those. Well, and I feel like so, yeah, I mean, our our education was definitely skewed more towards Alaskan natives. And I mean, I enjoyed Alaskan native history and, and things. The, you know, the Alaska Native Culture Center is like super cool. But I don't know if it's just my perception and maybe it's because maybe that's the part that we didn't really learn a whole lot of, but I feel like Alaska natives were not very combative compared to like native Americans, lower 48 native Americans. You know what I mean? Like native Alaskans were so spread out. Like, I don't think people realize how big Alaska is sometimes like it's enormous. It's mm -hmm. like two and a half times as big as Texas. Like it's just a massive state. And then on top of that, there just weren't as many tribes in there. Like there's what, like, I mean, there's a handful of tribes. They're all pretty sp five. I yeah, think. Yeah. Like five major tribes. I think it's five or seven major tribes. They're all spread out across again, a state that's two and a half times as big as Texas. And you're kind of like most of the time fighting elements, not each other. You know what I mean? Like, like mm -hmm. there's bears. You're, I mean, it's freaking cold up there. I mean, there are native tribes up there in Nome and like Bethel and that whole area. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. trying to survive minus 40 degree winters. You know what I mean? Like they don't have time yeah. to be fighting each other and, and all this kind of stuff. So I felt like the history that we learned in, in kind of our Alaska native studies was always more culturally driven. Like we learned a lot about, you know, what they ate, what they believed, what they, you know, how they made clothes, how they, you know, how they survived their houses, their tools, different things like that, what they, what they hunted, how mm -hmm. they hunted. And so I kind of went into this book expecting it to be like that. And it wasn't at all. And maybe it is because they were, they had such different experiences. Again, Alaska natives were a little bit more isolated. So there wasn't all of the conflict, but man, Native Americans were, I mean, brutal. I mean, talk about a, I mean, a, yeah. and not just to, you know, Western settlers. I mean, they were brutal to each other. Mm -hmm. They were brutal to, I mean, anybody that crossed their path. I mean, what a crazy, crazy time to be alive. Yeah. I, I, I know from what I remember in like uh, high school and stuff learning about native Alaskans is that the really, uh, combative tribe in Alaska were the clinkets and they were 
kind of secluded to Southeast Alaska. Everyone else and, and Athabascans like a little bit, those guys are the ones in the middle, but like the way I kind of think of it is like, there's really only one migrating species in uh, Alaska and that's caribou. And so if you're, if you're looking at like hunter gatherers, right, they have to be by a food source. So the Inuit and Inupiat, they have the ocean to live off of. They also have migrating herds of caribou, you know, all of the fish and seals and everything like that. Whales, Aleuts, obviously they're strung out along, along the Aleutian chain. No one's really bothering them except maybe the, um, the Yupix, which are down by like Bethel, but even then not so much. Athabascans, they have caribou, but like their swath of land or whatever really went all the way up until you hit like Haines, Yakutat area, because those mountains are like not impenetrable, but on the other side of those mountains are the Clinkets, right? So you're not going to go through there. The Clinkets, I mean, Southeast Alaska is like resource heaven right so it's like when when you look at like the need to move around or to compete for resources it's just completely different on the plains because yeah you have deer and you have a couple other things but you know every single native american tribe that lived on the great plains were buffalo like that's what they did and so the Sioux, the Apache, the Comanche, the Ute, the Navajo, every single one of them relied on the Buffalo and the Buffalo moved. And when the Buffalo move and you follow them, you're going to run into other tribes. And I think that that is probably one of the big reasons why they were so warlike is because their resource was always leaving them. And then, hey, there's another group that's competing for the same resource and I can take all their horses. Or, you know, I can I can take all their skins and all their meat or whatever, you know. And so it just builds contention in the area because your resource is always moving. Yeah. No, I get that. I don't think prior to reading this book, and I'm, American Buffalo is on my list of books for this year, but I don't think prior to reading this book that I had really grasped how many buffalo there were in the United States. Like, oh my gosh, have... Like, did we destroy the buffalo population? I mean, millions yeah. and millions of buffalo. I mean, there was there was a point in the book where it talks about kind of, I can't remember who it is, but there's like buffalo. So it's like after, towards the end, when Comanches have already started settling, like groups of them have already started settling. And then there's all of these like Westerner, exp Western expansion, like people coming out and just shooting buffalo. And it would say, I wrote it down, like how many buffalo they would kill a day. Um, but I mean, it was like... It was like thousands. Thousands a day. Yeah, they, I, I think in one year they killed 3 million buffalo. I mean, that's absurd. And that's just the ones that they counted. Yeah. Like, American buffalo, when you get into it, you'll you'll see like the animal of North America is buffalo. It wasn't the white-tailed deer. It wasn't the moose. It wasn't caribou. As numerous as those things are now today, buffalo ran from Alaska through Mexico. And they, like, I don't know. I, I think it's sometimes hard. Now I've... Uh, now I've read a couple different books on, on Buffalo and I've uh, listened to a bunch of different podcasts on it. I've gone to uh, South Dakota to the Lakota Museum and walked around there and read a bunch of stuff. Like now I'm starting to grasp the concept, but like actually understanding how many Buffalo that is I, you can't wrap your mind around that number. Like there are pictures like old timey pictures of people standing on what looks like a landfill, like literally a, a landfill mound of just Buffalo skulls, no other bones, just skulls. Yeah. That's insane. It's 
insane. And it wasn't even, I mean, it definitely was like westward expansion that kind of kicked it over the edge. But I mean, it even says in the book that, I mean, Comanches ate about six buffalo per person a year. Like that was, I mean, a a majority Mm -hmm. of the food that they ate um, as Plains Indians were, was buffalo. Like they ate about six. And I've seen buffalo. Buffalo, for anybody who hasn't seen a buffalo, buffalo are enormous. To think that you're going to eat six of them alone as an individual, that's, I mean, an absurd amount of meat that you're consuming. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that's eating an entire buffalo every two months. I don't even think I could do that if I tried. Like, that is so much. Like, you literally couldn't eat anything else all day because you would just be eating buffalo constantly to eat an entire buffalo every two months. But it did say that the Comanches, um, during kind of like their heyday, each Comanche would kill around 44 buffaloes every single year. So they'd eat six or eat the equivalent of six, but they would each kill on average... 44 which is crazy amount of like waste but it just goes to show like how many there were i mean they weren't at all worried about ever running out of buffalo at that point in in history like there were so many that they would just be like all right we need we need something to wear we're just going to kill a buffalo and leave leave the meat like that's crazy yeah i mean obviously like if each person ate six buffalo a year and they practice polygamy so they've got multiple wives that don't kill buffalo and kids so like it i don't think it's as much waste but like the thing is like i mean we'll go into it with american buffalo i don't want to pull a bunch of facts and and concepts from that book because uh that book is so good but um yeah when when you think about it though like how how is that even possible that there is that many Buffalo. Um, I think there's like two main things that often aren't talked about enough when talking about the Plains Indians living off of Buffalo is the first one is that with the, uh, the advent of guns and horses, it made the Plains Indians way more effective at hunting Buffalo, even to the point where like, because I, I think Coronado's expedition was somewhere around like 1600 or early, early 18 or 1700, 1500, somewhere around in there, right? From that point to 1850 was the heyday of the Comanches, which, which is only like 250 years. So when you really think about that, it's like four or five generations. I guess back then that, w- that was more generations, but it's really not that long of time where they had the horse and were super dominant. But during that same time, they were killing more buffalo than they ever had per person, right? However, the total number of buffalo that they were killing during that time probably went down a little bit because of the diseases that were brought through that killed, I mean like nine tenths of the Indians on the plains. So like, I mean, when you introduce cholera and it wipes out entire like, uh, tribes, entire tribes just gone from a disease. It's like, yeah, those, those Buffalo are repopulating it and whatever, like they're living off of it. Like, was that actually the number of Buffalo that were there normally? Because before then, there was millions more Indians, and they weren't able to kill as many of them. So it's like, I think, I don't know, I think the number of buffalo was inflated during the 1800s. And then, you know, the hide hunters came in and just literally smacked them all the way down to basically zero. So it was like, when... uh Oh man, I think when Cor- I think it's Coronado, it was either Coronado or Lewis and Clark. But when when they first pushed into the plains, they never really talked. It it must have been Coronado because Lewis and Clark did did talk about the the mountains moving basically. But uh, Coronado talked. He he hardly even mentioned buffalo. 
So there was already some sort of like balance between the buffalo and the plains tribes where they were like managing that species down to where it was like it was more level or whatever. So then the species blows up, right? The population explodes because of diseases coming through and there aren't as many Indians hunting buffalo. And then it's like shooting fish in a barrel with horses and guns or even just horses and arrows and lances, right? So I think that kind of like pushed them to the point of like killing more buffalo than, than quote normal because when you're living off the land like that, you do have to like everything you own, everything that you use is from that resource, you know? I don't know if any of that made sense, but that's no, kind of no, I get, I, I get. <laughs> in a non unorganized way though. Those are my thoughts on that. <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So kind of switching gears here. Cause again, I don't want to talk about Buffalo the entire time. Um, the, book gets pretty i don't know pretty split reviews i think most people really really like the book i it was a runner-up for the i don't know what's that the pulitzer prize the year it came out i mean it has glowing reviews on goodreads however there are, are a lot of people in kind of the goodreads community that review the book and say like read the first four chapters can't believe this is a book. I will never, ever, ever read a book this like this. And basically go on to say that the author comes across as extraordinarily racist in the book. So there is definitely a, like the author does not shy away from the fact that Native Americans, Indians are different than, you know, the West at all. You know, like he well, definitely or, yeah. outlines yeah. that, you know, the West had different, what would you call that? Different, uh, I mean, definitely a different like technological level, but also like a different moral code and moral compass than a lot of the Native Americans, for instance. Like he, he goes on to say like Indians were pretty, I mean, it was pretty routine and pretty normal to rape and kill children and women as captives and that, you know, physical torture, you know, cutting off limbs, scalping people wasn't seen as something bad. It was just kind of seen as what you do when you capture somebody from a different tribe. Didn't, didn't matter if they were, um, you know, Westerners or didn't matter if it was just a different tribe. And so it's pretty well, I, I would say not pretty well. It's, it's very detailed in the book, you know, like he, he definitely goes in and I don't think he pulls any punches in trying to describe the brutality and the mindset of the Comanches. Did you find that as, I don't know, racist in any way, or did you, I mean, what were your thoughts on that? Did that turn you off from the book at all? Because it definitely had an effect on quite a few readers in Goodreads. Um, me personally, I'm more of a a fact over feelings kind of person. So, you know, if that's the way it was, that's the way it was. And, you know, I'm not taking anything away from anybody that lives now, but that's just my personal opinion. So, but there are a lot of people that were like, you can't say that. I mean, they had, you know, and I don't, I don't know. What are, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I think he wrote the book from the beginning with, the like knowing what happened in the end right so he had context into the things that he would later get into the people at the beginning of the book they hear everything that he said and are, they're like oh my gosh like you can't can't say those things but after you learn more about like quana parker and the comanches that are actually interviewed at the end of the book they're very open about what they did you know, Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Quana Parker, all of those people, like, they're very honest and open about what they do. And then in the end of the book, he he gets into more of like, like, just kind of like giving context into, yeah, like, these are different peoples colliding. It'd be the same exact thing if, if China and communism came to America and we had we have customs that are completely different from them and them looking at us and saying oh my gosh like 
this is insane. I can't, I can't believe that they have, you know, multiple wives or I can't believe that they scalp people or that they burn people alive. Now also with those things, like, yeah, those are brutal and everything. And it, it was fairly like normal for the Comanches and the Apaches to do those things. But also like he, he doesn't hold back any punches when describing what the American government did to the Comanches or what the U S military did to the Comanches or what other, you know, per- particularly the Texas Rangers, when he gets into like what the Texas Rangers did to the Comanches, the back and forth, like he doesn't say, Oh, and then, you know, the Texas Rangers buried their dead. It's like, no, there was a custom on the planes. You just scalped everybody. It like, if you lost your bodies were mutilated and you were scalped didn't matter which side it was it was par for the course you know and so there was the uh oh man i'm gonna forget the name of it again but uh i think it's called like the sand river massacre yeah i have it written down or whatever but it was the the cheyenne massacre sand creek the sand creek massacre it was a bunch yeah. of cheyenne indians yeah so he doesn't withhold from telling that history like the fact is i i think he just tells it the way it was and yeah it's probably not the most quote politically correct way to to go about it which i'm kind of grateful that he he didn't you know censor that because i didn't want him to censor the other side of it too the way that you know america treated every single treaty that they had but also the way that the indians treated treaties and it's just like just tell me the way that it happened and the feelings that were felt on both sides based off of, you know, journal entries and autobiographies and things like that. And just let the chips where they, you know, fall where they lie. It's kind of how I feel. Yeah, I feel I feel like that, too. I feel like if you censor history based on like current political correctness or, you know, current ideals, current value systems that are in place now and you censor history based on that, there's no way that you can learn from history. Does that make sense? Like you're taking away from the mm-hmm. learning process. I mean, that's how people learn, right? I mean, that's that's how kids learn. And I would say that's 90% of how I learn personally is I make mistakes and then you learn from those mistakes. But if you're not allowed to you know, talk about the mistakes or talk about the the pitfalls or talk about the kind of the ugly side of your, of someone's actions, then how are you supposed to kind of reflect and learn and grow from that? Like we would never be where we are as a society today without kind of, without the mistakes of the past, you know? And so I, Mm -hmm. I, I kind of hated that. Like I was reading through the reviews on Goodreads and it was like, it was making my blood boil. I was like, people were like, you can't, you can't say that about people. Like you can't, like, this is just so racist to, to view it through this lens. And I was like, you mean, view it through the lens of like truth and history. Like what lens do you want to view history from? Like there is only one mm-hmm. there, there, there should only be one lens of history and that is, you know, true unbiased reports. And then from there people can start that then from there you can apply your biases. Does that make sense? Then you can start to say like, Oh, mm-hmm. based on our knowledge now we know, you know, you shouldn't, tie up children and drag them behind horses. You know what I mean? Like, that's just not okay. And then on the flip side, you can say, oh yeah, well, Mm. you shouldn't go into a village full of women and children and set their tents on fire. You know what I mean? Like bad, bad, bad on both sides, you know, like, and that's what I thought the book did Mm. a very good job of is like you said, it wasn't all anti, anti Indian and it wasn't all anti, you know, mean, big bag meet America. It was kind of just a, you know, this is a brutal time in history. (laughs) Here are the facts. Mm -hmm. It was just brutal to be there. Like the planes were brutal. Doesn't matter who you were. You Mm -hmm. could be a Texas Ranger and you'd get, you know, scalped, beheaded and, you know, drug behind a horse, or you could be an Indian and, you know, just as bad set on fire. (laughs) Not good. Mm hmm. So, yeah. And I I would also argue, you know, <clears throat> it's not like he was saying like the Indians were a savage people or whatever. It was like, this is 
what they were doing, you could go ask, like, if you were to, you know, try and censor the way that uh, the history of the Comanches was told, I, w- I would almost be surprised if the Apache and the Kiowa and the Ute and the Navajo and everyone else that was around them didn't kind of perk up and say, like, wait a minute. They bullied us for a really long time. You know, it's like it really kind of shifted my perspective on because like I always knew that like the if, I'm not always, but like as I've gotten into this topic a lot, I've I've realized like these are warring groups and they go around and they raid each other and and all that stuff. But like there really are top dogs. Right. And every other tribe, unfortunately, is kind of bullied by these big ones like up north you had the Sioux and the Sioux beat up on everybody around them you know and then you had down low you had the Comanches and towards the west the Apaches would beat up on everybody else because they were getting beat up by the Comanches and you know it's like you can't like I don't know you can't just gloss over the history and just say like the, oh this one group wasn't that bad because it, it's like and it, even then it's like you can't just group them all into one group like they're all so different it's it's literally like 40 different countries all right next to each other you know and so it's like saying you know europe and putting europe in one in one box like sure they're all one box now because of the EU or whatever, but like, but they're definitely you know, not. sixty years ago. They're definitely right. Not. I mean, culturally, so, like, so different from each other. Historically, so right. different from each other. Like lived experiences, mm-hmm. so different from each other. I mean, everything. Languages, languages, religion, yeah. personal, like every everything. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. the difference between an Eastern European or <laughs> and like, I mean, even just a, over a couple over a couple countries and you've got, you know, Mm -hmm. Greece. I mean, it's so different, like lived experience of Greece versus lived experience of somebody coming from Lithuania, Estonia, even though that's like, I mean, it's literally probably the distance of top to bottom of Utah. You know, it's, it's not that far away from each other and so different in experience and in culture and everything. Yeah. So then trying to group them all together, right. It, and say like, they did this or whatever it's just it's so different because like the kiowa are so different from the comanche which is different from the apache which is different from the ute which is different from you know as we learn like towards the end of the book once they do start going to the reservations they they're like all of the eastern slash you know quote civilized indian tribes like the choctaw and the cherokee and the Cheyenne and the Seminole, they they show up in Oklahoma. They don't even know what the Comanche are, and and they show up and they're like, okay, we're gonna start planting stuff. And the Comanche come in at night and destroy everything they own and steal everything they have. And they're like, what the freak? You know, it's like it's the same thing. It's like you're comparing, you're saying, okay, these are the same people. You're pushing them all into this box putting people from Spain and Sweden and Lithuania and Greece all in the same box and say, yeah, just, you know, chill out here in this land that has literally nothing, you know? No, I, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you. I think it's, you can't lump everybody in together. Like you said, I mean, the, the amount of just geographical difference between native American tribes is even greater than, I mean, everybody in Europe, like Europe's tiny compared to the United States. So to think that the, the differences between native American tribes is going to be any smaller than the difference between, you know, countries within Europe, it's just absurd. Like, from like a just a logical standpoint, of course they're going to be different. They live in different climates. They live in. They have different experiences. They have different food. They have different customs. They have different religions. You know, it's just, of course they're going to be different. So treating them all the same was was not a good. I mean, not a good, not a good decision. And I think, I don't know, this book, 
definitely made me think about kind of the way that America treated um, Indians, especially, you know, during that time period. I mean, as the, as pretty much the Comanches fell, that was kind of the end of wild. I mean, he says that in the book, like it was the end of really wild native Americans, wild Indians anywhere in the United States. At that point, the Comanches were kind of the last, Mm -hmm. the last straw that fell in that. Um, there may have been some more kind of up North area, I think a little bit, but for the most part, like I would say 90% of all of the Indians in, in the United States had pretty much been either captured or like forced into reservations. And so I don't know that whole topic of, you know, how the United States handled that is a very, I don't know, to say touchy subject in the country right now is pretty much is, is a pretty <laughs> understatement. Like, I think a lot of people kind of talk about that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who feel like one, we stole the land two that, you know, we should be giving it back or, you know, reparations need to be paid and everything like that. Did this book change or influence your ideas about one, the way that the United States handled it and two, kind of the way that we should view it through the lens of today? Um, this book, I think added a lot of like, I don't know, a lot of clarity to some ideas that I had had before. So one thing was like, to say that Native Americans got gypped out of every deal, I think is not exactly accurate because they they were ripping America off in their minds every time as well. So, you know, America comes and they're like like we'll give you horses and and you know, different things for this land and they're like sure. And then in 6 months we're just going to take it back from you cuz we know that we can beat you up. And that happened over and over and over again as well as the fact like the concept of uh, you know, n- no one can own the land. Um, I think that that it's kind of like a misnomer from, from what I've kind of understood. They had territory, right? It was a concept that like something higher than higher than the two people standing there gives you a right to that land versus just fighting for it. I think that is the difference. Like manifest destiny, they didn't have a concept of fighting over land and owning land was something that I think they did understand for, for the sure. most part. For sure. Because um, like, like, I mean, yeah. like it started off in this book. I mean, they were, we were talking about a, a group that started off in a, a not so desirable land, you know, wind river, I mean, it's gorgeous, but it's kind of a harsh environment to live. You know, Wind Mm. River, Wyoming, it's cold, snows, you know, food source, winter, really, really rough to, you know, a a nation that ended up pushing basically every other group out of most of West Texas. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. they took, they so like obviously they had an idea of, like this land is ours now, you know, cause they, mm-hmm. they had a land and then they moved and they took over a better one. You know what I mean? Right. But it wasn't, right. it wasn't so, so much in, like, in that sense, I think you had to occupy it in their minds almost like you had to be there. It's only yeah. your land as long as you're sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and, and, and like, that's, that's what I mean is like, the, they had a concept of like running the land and this being mine, but like the concept of like manifest destiny, destiny where like the Americans were saying, the higher God says that this is our land. So you have to get out. I don't think that they understood that concept as well as like, what do you mean? We're not going to fight over this over and over and over again to the end of time. Like you're saying this is final. Like, I don't, I just don't think that they kind of understood that. Um, I think what, uh, um, Quana Parker said to, um, I think his name is William something, uh, when he had him over f- for like dinner one time, 
where he he was like, I'm going to explain to you how the the white man took over the native lands. And so he asks him to sit on the log and Quana sits next to him. And he's like, okay, scoot over. And then Quana scoots over. Or, you know, he, the, the white guy scoots over a little bit. Quana scoots closer to him. He says, scoots over again. Right. And they keep going until he falls off the log. And he said, that's how it happened. Like, that's really accurate. I think it, up until the fall of the Comanches and then, you know, right there at the end with uh, uh, Battle of Little Bighorn and the Sioux. Like, it, it was just this constant little progression that happened over time rather than, like, stealing all of the lands. It was from the time that the Pilgrims hit Plymouth Rock, it was America inching forward, not as stealing land but but warring over lands it it was a territorial battle that unfortunately for the native americans they lost you know and yeah that's kind of the way that i've seen it i see it now it's it's not so much that it was stolen it's, as much as it was it was a battle and there was a winner and there was a loser i'm i'm not one to say which one is right i think in every war really they're un unless it's over a principle like in world war ii i mean but um, kind of not even if it's over land it, you're just both losers right it, you both lose in that scenario so i think one loses a little bit harder but i don't want to declare one like yeah america had the right or whatever it it is what it is and it happened you know and it was unfortunate for the native americans it there were reasons why it happened mainly because you know it, it wasn't one cohesive unit i think if it was one cohesive unit they would have driven the pilgrims right back into the ocean and then the american settlement never would have happened right like the reason why america won was because of technology and you know putting a significant amount of manpower behind a single mission whereas the plains tribes couldn't i mean it's the same same thing in mongolia like Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun, the reason why they were so successful in wiping out the entire plateau is because they got all of the steppe people, which were ran in the same manner as Native American tribes, where it's just little bands of people all around to get to gang up on a single mission, which was destroy the Chinese or destroy, you know, the uh, the people to the to the west of them. I forget who it is. It's not the Romans, but um the persians right it's like if they all were to get up together they would they would be a bigger army and they could win but once they're disbanded i mean look at mongolia today look at the native americans today i i don't i don't think of it as like we stole the land or we did something like we pulled a cloak over their eyes i, th I just think it was a war you know yeah I, that might be my kid crying. Yeah, so. I can't tell if that's yours or mine. So that's why I keep taking these headphones off. But um, no, I agree with you. I think, again, it's it's hard because I think if this were to happen today, I mean, it, it actually has happened today a little bit. You know, so, so Russia goes in and they're like trying to grab land, mm -hmm. you know, and the rest of the world is like freaking out. They're like, no, that's not okay. You know, we don't grab land anymore. Like, that doesn't happen. But I think what people don't... Again, this is just like a, a, a through the lens of time. You know, in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, all the way back through to, like, the beginning of time, that is just kind of what you did. It didn't matter who you were. I mean, there were no good guys and bad guys. Like, you just kind of were going out there and claiming land. Like, that's just the reality mm -hmm. of it. So, I mean, everybody did it. Like, I mean, I mean, I can't, I'm trying to think of anybody who, like, didn't do that. But that is essentially kind of the way that history evolved. And if you look at Europe, you had, you know, Romans come in and they tried to collect as much land as possible and push the boundaries. And then you had Greeks come in and they tried to push the boundaries. And then you had Ottomans come in and they tried to push the boundaries. And then you had like, you know, 
Austria, Austro-Hungarian, you know, Germanic tribes come in and they push the boundaries. And, you know, that that is what people did forever. So I think, again, it's just, it's hard because I don't think that there was any sort of, again, you just can't apply the same moral compass to it. The one thing that this book did get me kind of thinking more of, and again, it, it if you look at it from the opposite perspective, I mean, the Comanches did the same thing. They pushed other nations out of this land and they fought it and they pushed their boundaries. The one thing that this book did kind of start make me think a little bit about what's kind of the post surrender treatment of Native Americans and the like shoddy, like less than a dollar per acre buying your land, but you don't actually get your land anymore. And kind of when they mentioned the rations and the way that they fed the Native Americans, like they were all promised a certain amount of beef every single month. But the beef was counted on like a percentage of like the, the amount of meat that you could get off of one cow. They didn't actually like pre-butcher the meat and, you know, vacuum seal it and send it to the, (laughs) send it to the Native Americans and, uh, you know, preservatives. This was the 1800s. So you had to, you basically gave them a cow's worth of meat and they, you know, that was their meat allotment as part of the treaty. And that meat allotment didn't change based on the time of year. So in the winter when cows were really, really skinny and had no meat on them, I mean, Indians just starved because they were given a cow that was presumably 50% meat when in actuality it was 5% meat and it had, you know, really little to no nutritional value on it. And the government was like, meh, sucks to suck. You know, like we gave you a whole cow. So like, Mm -hmm. that's the part about native American history that definitely makes me feel for native Americans like that. And then the kind of, the lack of help in the assimilation side of things. Again, I think kind of isolating people. You saw people like Quanta Parker who kind of excelled in life because of his ability to assimilate's not the right word, but the ability to at least learn the customs and become familiar and be able to, you know, communicate and work within the system. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of native Americans Mm. weren't even given the chance to work within the system. They were just plopped on a plot of land and the government said, here's your one cow every single month, have fun. You know, there, here's $10 till you die. See you later. You know what I mean? So that was the treatment and kind of the eye opening part that again, it, it is, it's just kind of sad because I feel like in in the history that I've seen and I've read about people who, I mean, obviously they're, like you said, there are winners and losers in war and the losers often fare a little bit worse than, than the winners for sure. However, the people that end up surrendering and, you know, trying to become part of that society in history, I feel like have done a lot better than the native Americans. You know what I mean? Like they just, I don't, I don't feel like they were given the, the fair chance to, to really thrive within, right. Within the United States. And maybe that was because the cultures were so vastly different. And the, you know, that gap between them is, you know, the gap between a native American and a, you know, a New Yorker was way bigger than the gap between, you know, a Roman and a Greek. But either mm-hmm. way, I felt like it was just difficult for people for, for a group that had surrendered and said, okay, we're going to do our best like they weren't even given the chance to do their best. Right. I, I totally agree. I honestly, like obviously like the warring and the raiding and stuff, it's, it's very sad, but I think the part that really breaks my heart is knowing that there's this group of people who do have a culture that, you know, outside of the raiding and the other, you know, things that we can objectively say is morally wrong they had a culture and, you know, personalities and family relationships and a relationship to the land. And all of that was destroyed, not by a war, but by a corrupt office of Indian affairs, right once they did surrender. And so you just get this situation where like the assimilation is a big, a big thing where you can say, okay, that was, 
that was wrong. Like what's, what's wrong with letting people, at least if they're going to peaceably live amongst the plains, what's wrong with them doing that? Like, why can't they have their own land within America, right? Where they, they lease grazing rights to, uh, ranchers in Texas or whatever, you know, like if they say like, I know that they tried it many times. And so it is a difficult thing to say is like, let them be Comanche, just have them be peaceable. Like Quana Parker does talk about like being Comanche means being a raider. Like I do get that. That's difficult to do. But if there was a middle ground where you could say, okay, like they're right at the end of Quantum Parker's life, right? Where he had to go to DC to say like, no, we don't want to sell our reservation land. Like why the freak were they asked to, to sell their reservation land? Like, why can't they just lease grazing rights? What's, what's wrong with them having a little chunk? Like now we understand, you know, uh, there are reservations now and whatnot. Like there's nothing wrong with having these, bands of of native americans where they can practice their heritage and stuff as long as they you know don't do things that are objectively morally wrong and they do have treaties now where they you know pay taxes or whatever i'm not going to get into any, all of that stuff but like it, it it is just sad to me that you have these people where like their entire heritage is destroyed and to become Americans, they're thrown out into this sphere where everything they know is bad and illegal and you aren't given any help. Like you're literally stuck in a pit and they're like, see ya. You know, like we gave you the, the worst place to live in America and you're stuck there. I mean, it's, it. I don't want to compare it, but it's like, it's, I don't want to say it's worse, but it's very comparable to like right once, uh, slavery was abolished, you know, uh, blacks in the South, they were considered three fifths of a person and weren't given any opportunity to, to make themselves, you know, legitimate members of the society that they were a part of. Like they just went from slavery to another form of slavery. So it's like, it, what kind of system are you setting up for these people? It's just a terrible, terrible system. And it, it, like he goes into, you know, obviously like the office of Indian affairs, but like they were just stuffing all of that money into their pockets and giving these native American tribes, nothing like that to me is like, yes, the wars were terrible, but the war was mutual. Once you get into okay, the Indians surrender, that's all America's fault, I think. And I think, I mean, I didn't think about this while in the book, and, and I honestly, I didn't think about it till you were just talking, but I mean, really what it comes down to is it's, it's a system set up by weak and scared men, to be honest. Like, that's really all it is. Like, if you get to a point where you're not confident enough in your abilities to continue to be competitive with adding new people into, you know, around you and adding and giving them a fair shot at also being competitive, you know what I mean? Then that's just, that's you as a weak individual. You know what I mean? Like, in my opinion, I, I mean, I wouldn't ever want to run a race where I was the only one wearing shoes. You know what I mean? Like, it just isn't fair. It wouldn't mean anything if you win, but that was kind of, I feel like the mentality post-war and also like post-slavery and post all this, like it got to a point where it's like, all right, we can let them kind of come in and be a part of this, but we don't want to, we also don't want to like lose what we have. So we're going to handicap them for the next you know couple of years or however mm -hmm. long we can handicap them because we're not confident enough in our own ability. And we're not, you know, we're not confident that the, the system can rise and bring everybody up together instead. You know, it's all about me, 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 mine. And again, I think that's just weak individuals not looking out for, for other people. Cause I do agree that the moment that those things come to an end, that's, that's the, like, that's the true ugly part about the history 
in my opinion, the wars and, you know, everything else that happened, that was, I mean, that was, although it's, it's brutal and it's, you know, it, it can be gross in some points, but that, that's just the history of war fair throughout all, all of time. It's the post how the U S is always like how the U S handled how the department of Indian affairs, how everybody handled that afterwards that really shows again, the, the lack of the lack of the characters involved to really be like, okay, no, we're going to give everybody a mm-hmm. fair shot from now on because they surrendered. So now they are Americans and let's build everybody up together, you know, and that, and that's kind of what was missing back right. then. So it is, yeah, it and, is sad. It's weak people. And like with that, it's like, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Keep going. That was just wanted to reiterate that. Um, when I went to the, uh, I don't know the exact name of it. I want to say it's the, the Sioux museum or the museum of Plains Indians or something like that. It's in South Dakota, right next to the crazy horse monument. Um, one of the things that I learned about that was a little jarring when I first saw it was like, to me, like what is an American? It's someone who upholds the values of religious freedom, you know, the constitution, uh, you know, freedom to vote, all of those things like expression of oneself, like that, that is America, right? When they assimilated all of the native Americans, they stripped them of their identities, their religious freedoms, their ability to choose a lot of things is like, we weren't making them American. We were making them, you know, white. That's, that's totally different. You know, you can be, you know, just, you know, you can love whatever, whatever culture you can be, you know, whatever you are, as long as you like, like upholding the American values and upholding the constitution is, is very different than, you know, wearing some dorky outfit and cutting your hair a certain way and being part of one religion. Right. Like that was never the point. Like that was the whole reason we left England was for religious freedom. And then we're going to take their religious freedom away from them and taxes. I I felt like that's why we left. I'm feeling, I'm feeling that I'm feeling that this time of year. Dump the tea in the Harbor, which is still why I don't drink tea. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But no, but it, that was something that was really jarring to me. Was like they had pictures of these uh, these Sioux kids, where dude, they're they're all lined up and their haircuts are atrocious because none of them wanted to cut their long black hair because it's significant to them and their culture. You know, they're all having to wear these dorky outfits because they're not allowed to wear buffalo skins anymore. It's like that was another thing to me that was that was very wrong. Was assimilation like you can look a certain way and still like the Comanches did, right? They had their land. They leased it out to, to ranchers for grazing and they still hunted on their land that they're paying taxes on, on the money that they earn. They're trading, they're being peaceful. Like, dude, that's an American. Like what's wrong with that? Nothing. So they went the extra step with that office of Indian affairs, trying to, quote, assimilate all of these tribes and make them what some like Irish American guy, like they're never going to be like, you just destroyed and, and depressed an entire nation of people who are now a responsibility of America because you, you took them over. Like, this is our responsibility, you know? Yeah. No, the real, the real assimilation, like you said, should come from the, the ideals of the American constitution. I mean, that should be it, right? Like if you truly believe in, in freedom and, you know, freedom of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, you know, freedom to associate, you know, freedom. And, and that really is, that is what makes an American in my opinion. And so it doesn't matter if you're, you know, uh, 
Mexican American, if you're uh, you know Irish American, if you're an African American, if you're an Alaskan American, Native American. I mean, that really shouldn't have mattered. The, the most important thing should have been you know that n- now they uphold the Constitution and you know follow the the basic rules of law, and that should be it. You know, you should be able to do outside of that, like do whatever the heck you want. Right. So, um, all right. A couple more questions. First one. Comanche or Texas Ranger? Who would you have rather been? Comanche. Comanche? 100%. Uh, and I'll say why. I have, ever since I started getting on this topic, I have wanted to be, I, I said this over and over again. I, I just said, I was like, I want to be a Sioux hunter riding bareback without a shirt on with long black hair, hunting buffalo. Your little ginger all, all kid. That, like, <laughs> yeah well long black hair i don't want to ginger hair but I, what i what i realized reading this book was like this is a rough life and it's definitely not as uh easy going as i had thought it would be um and so you know like yeah but as, as far as like um I mean, I don't know. To, honestly, it's like it, it seemed like the Comanches knew what they were doing. And it seemed like the Texas Rangers did not know what they were doing, but they had more bodies to dispose of and a l- better technology. And so if I'm going to be on, like, yeah, it's a losing battle, but at least you know, I have confidence in what I'm doing. I'd rather be a Comanche. Yeah, I will say I agree with you, except for there was a section in the book where the Texas Rangers basically turned from get off your horse and fire your rifles to like the first time that they got the Colt like six shooters and they're like, they like learn how to shoot off the horse and they're like doing the tricks where they're like, falling off the side of the horse, shooting under the neck, turning around backwards and shooting their, like their six, their six shooters. And this is the first time in history that there's ever been just like revolvers. Um, that seems pretty dope. <laughs> like, like that to me is yeah. like the original cowboy and the Texas Rangers during that period. I mean, they sounded pretty awesome. So I would agree like anytime before that Comanche all the way. And after that, like once the Comanches caught up a bit, I would say Comanche, but there was that like sweet spot period of being a Texas Ranger where you're like finally learning how to ride a horse for not for like, yeah, not for transport, but for like agility and speed. And then at the same time, you're also like balling with guns that like are brand new. Um, that was pretty sweet. Like that was a cool section of the book. Like I was like, man, Texas Rangers are dope. Also Texas Rangers are crazy. I did not know that they were like basically fighting a two front war and the fact that they were like having to fight the Comanches for survival in Texas. And at the same time, for anybody who doesn't know, like time frame wise, I don't know why I didn't put this together. They were also like being called up because of the civil war was going on at the same time. And it was like, all right, guys, like we need you to protect yeah. the Western front of Texas so that people don't get murdered by Comanches. But we also need you to come fight in like the civil war. Like what a crazy time in yeah. history. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't know why I never put two and two yeah. together. I always think of like significant historical events happening almost in isolation of each other. But this is like two major fronts happening at the same time. That was when you're forgetting the front half of it too. The front half was the militias that fought the Mexicans in the Texas Mexican War. Yeah, yeah, I or mean, the I American forget, Mexican War, or whatever. I always forget that. You know, so there's like that sweet spot. I think his name. I I am probably wrong on this, but I think his name is like. No, it's definitely not that. I don't know. It's like John Carson or he, when he took over, he was a straight Texas Rangers. There was like, there was four (laughs) or five years where he took the Texas Rangers to the moon. Yeah. They were so right after he left. So cool. Yeah. Right after he left though, they became a bunch of bums. 
And that's why they got called back into the Civil War is because they started losing to the Comanches over and over and over again. They're like, okay, let's put a pause on this. We need you to come fight with the Confederate Army. Yeah, that and they also... um, What was it? They also did that massacre. Like, and that was... Like, after he died, the next person that came over, that was that big Cheyenne... Uh, Yeah. whatever Creek massacre. I'm trying to look at yeah, the sand phone. Creek, sand massacre. Creek massacre yeah. was right after sand Creek, right after him. And then the, the government was like, that was, that was really bad. What you did. <laughs> like, like I, like that, that, that pushed things too it far. Was and it objectively was objectively really bad. wrong, even in war. Yeah. Really yeah. bad. And so, yeah, there was that sweet spot period though, where that dude was in charge. I can't remember his name again. But he, that would have been that would have been fun. That was a sweet time to be a Texas Ranger. <laughs> um, all right. Did you by chance keep track of Oh, actually get on just on that note though, with like the Texas Rangers being brought up literally to protect the Texans from the Comanche specifically. One of the stories that he talks about was like the Apache and the Comancheros were like, which the Comancheros were like the early Mexicans. They were like fighting all of the time. And the Comancheros, because they were, you know, working with Spain or whatever, they had uh, a system of diplomacy that they were trying to work with the Apaches. And at one point out of the blue, this, because the Apaches were a bit closer together than the Comanches the Apaches came to the Comancheros and were like, all right, we are, we're wanting to uh, sign a treaty. Like we want to do a treaty. And they're like, oh, okay, this is going to be awesome. And they, they're they like, we're going to get uh, all of these guys baptized. They're all going to believe in Jesus. And they're like, okay, you need to meet us here at this time. And they're like, okay, sweet. And so the Comancheros go up to meet the Apaches and all the Apaches are gone. And they're like, what the crap? where are all the Apaches? And then they like look over the Hills and it's like the main camp of the Comanches. And what had happened was the Apaches were so tired of getting beat up by the Comanches. They're like, you know what? Maybe we should get the, the Comancheros to come over here and beat the, uh, beat the Comanches for us because we're getting hammered from both sides. But what ended up happening was the, the, (laughs) The uh, Comanches beat the shiz out of the Comancheros and pushed the Comancheros all the way back deeper into Mexico and just expanded the territory that the the Comanches were on. So they took Apache land while the like Apache and uh, Comanchero land because the Apaches were trying to like fit their two enemies against each other. I I thought that was hilarious. So. Yeah, but. no, I agree. There were some there were some funny stories. And throughout, I mean, the, the basic theme of all the stories was like, don't mess with the Comanches. Like, you know, th- it never works. Like, they were just too good. Um, throughout the book, did you at all pick up, like, write down some of your favorite names? Uh, I, I have some that I, I really like. Um, I think uh, Red Cloud is a pretty sweet name. Uh, obviously crazy horse is a is a great name um we were on two different wavelengths here because my favorite was pucha na ra hib i think that's yeah that's what i i I spelled it out it's it's no pocha na ra hib which means erection that won't go down oh yeah that one was pretty pretty good (laughs) and then (laughs) you had buffalo hump which also they said translated from a different dialect to coyote vagina. <laughs> so, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I was like, nice. Those were pretty, I mean, I don't know how what you, was funny. I don't know how you get your nickname or your name. It's not even a nickname. That's what they name you. I don't know how you get your name in Indian, uh, yeah. like culture, but I mean, what do you have to do to get the nickname erection that won't go down? You know, like that's a that's a that's a that's rough, brutal dude. That's a rough, a rough call to life right there. Yeah. What's funny though is like for anybody 
who doesn't know this is like the parent doesn't name their child. In fact, Quana, the the last you know Comanche chief, whose mom. We, I mean, we didn't even get into uh, his mom at all. Yeah, I mean the Parkers were just a crazy family. But um, anyway, yeah, Quana and his brother were the only people that this author could find whose parent named them. Like generally speaking, the tribe or, you know, whatever the band like names the person, you know? And so like, you don't pick your name, like your name is picked for you by just whoever you're hanging out with one day like you could trip over a rock and then your name is falls over rocks for the whole rest of your life i mean i could i could see how that happens because i mean you're hanging out around the boys you're out hunting and then you do something stupid and all of a sudden all the boys around you are calling you coyote vagina for the rest of your life <laughs> you know like I, yeah it makes I you get, wonder how he got it i get it <laughs> i get though how you just live in fear of doing one dumb thing for the rest of your life <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i thought yeah. that was awesome i was like man the names that people would have nowadays if a group of your best friends chose your name for you based on the stupid things that you did in life good luck <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so what would you rate this book on a scale of one to five for both fun and importance? Uh, importance, I would give it a four. I think it's a very, um, like, obviously it doesn't go into, um, all of the Native American histories, which Native American history in general, I think is super important for Americans to learn. Uh, so it doesn't go into all of the bands and all of the tribes history, but as far as uh, learning like a really important case study of how Native Americans fought the Americans and then also the subsequent treaties and things that were done. Um, I think it's I think it's really important to understand how that that whole process kind of kind of was laid out in history. Uh, as far as fun goes, it it's one hundred percent my kid. Don't don't worry about it. Um, as far as fun goes, I I would give it. Uh, I see. I want to give it a four or four and a half. Um, but I'm going to give it a three just because of how, no, I'm going to give it a three and a half because of how repetitively, repetitively gruesome it is. It can be hard to listen to. Um, it's not an easy listen, but as far as, as how informative it is and how much I learned reading it, um, I, I have to give it a higher score despite the fact that it is so repetitively gruesome repetitively gruesome can't say that so i think i'd give it a five on importance personally i think it's important to know these kinds of things and i also think yeah. it is important to have a perspective of of not a one-sided of per, one-sided perspective of violence you know what i mean like i don't think it was yeah i'm gonna change it to five yeah i feel bad okay importance yeah i mean i i i just, Again, violence is bad, and but it was coming from both sides, and that was just the relationship that it was. And I think it's important to understand that because it gives you a different perspective as to kind of like the history that went down there. Um, as far as fun goes, I think I would give it a three and a half. One, because it doesn't have all of the like cultural stuff that I wish it that, that I wish it had. So I was kind of always wanting a little bit more. And some of the battles, like you said, are almost in, too in depth. Like, I, I, I will never ever remember what the name of the canyon is that they went through to escape, and what the name of the river is that they got. You know, you know what I mean. Like, it was almost too historical and not cultural enough, in my opinion. So that's why I would give it a three and a half in the fun side of things. I think it could have been more fun had they mixed in a little bit more, a bit of, a little bit more knowledge about you know. Again, culture, history, or customs, what they, 
what they believed, religion, those kinds of things, I think would have been a little bit more fun. Um, also, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I kind of struggle with history books in general because I'm just not, I have a hard enough time with names. You know what I mean? Like I can't remember the names, you know, John, Jacob, James, Blake, and Aaron, you know what I mean? Like, and those are about the whitest names that you could possibly find. And so a book <laughs> full of names that like, I definitely can't pronounce and definitely don't understand. Like I will just never remember the names of these people and a lot of the locations as well. It, it's, it's a personal problem, but I just have a hard time with that. And so I feel like when I read historical books like this, I like it and I enjoy it while I'm reading it and it is kind of fun, but it's hard for me to like remember everything. Like I feel like I could read this book five times and still not, still not be able to regurgitate a lot of that information back to you. So historical books in general, I just have a little bit of a harder time getting into, which is why it's a three and a half fun for me. But for somebody who's like really into history and likes like battle history, because I know that there's a lot of people out there who like love like specific battle, like wartime history and like the, like the kind of detailed account of war, then this is a, this is the book for you for Comanches. Like that is what this book is. And I, that's who I feel like it's written for. I personally just respond a little bit better to a little bit more of a kind of emotional connection, not so much a data driven connection in books. I'm slowly finding that out as I read. This is like new for me as a reader. I just, I don't respond very well to just like the straight fact of books. Like I definitely need to have a little bit more of an emotional buy-in to remember things. Yeah. I think uh, one thing that helped me, because I, I listened to it pretty quick um, on like a faster speed. Um, so I, I had to do this to really kind of like kind of keep track of everything that was going on is as I was listening, when I heard a new name, I would look them up um, so that I could see a picture of them. So like when he's describing who Quanta Parker is or who Sitting Bull is or... Don't they all uh, look the same? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> so, I was like, what? <laughs> that was a joke. It was a bad joke, but it was a joke. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I got it, but I was like, uh, anyway. Um, so, yeah, as, as I was looking at them, it wasn't just, like, the people. I, I was looking up, uh, you know, people on the American side as well. I was also looking up, like, the terrain that they were on because he talks about, like, the plains being this vast grassland and, like, dude, I've driven through West Texas. It's a vast dirt land. But, like, you know, trying to, you know, put into context of like what the land looked like, what these horses looked like, you know, all of those different things really helped me to kind of organize, uh, the, um, like my thoughts as I was hearing all of these things. It, it did make it a little easier in my opinion and a little bit more fun. Yeah. I like, I usually listen up to books somewhere between 1.75 and 1.5 speed. Um, this book I listened to at one, I can't tell you the last time I listened to a book like at one speed, but it was that hard for me to like keep up with and understand what was going on. So I like really had to slow it down and I took tons of notes on my phone of just like, who's this person? Like this person talked to this person and this person talked to this person. So I was trying to follow along. It's just, it's one of those things that I struggle with. Like I, it's hard for me. I, I feel like, I feel like I have two sides of my brain, you know, like I've got, the, the math side of my brain that is like zero emotion and all just numbers. And I do really well with that. And I get math. I can see math problem solving really, really good. The other side of my brain that deals with like history and people is all emotional or visual. Like it's not like I can't remember anybody's name ever. You could tell me your name 30 times and I'll still ask you what your name is. Um, but I can always, I will remember every face and I will remember like what we talked about and you know who you are. It's just, so that's what makes these books a little bit difficult for me. Cause I feel like as an individual, I connect with people in more of an emotional or visual way than I do otherwise. So that's a long way of saying I, I, I suck at reading books like this. <laughs> so I don't know. But I did enjoy it. It still was a 3.5 fun. Like it was, I, 
it was incredibly important. Very, very glad that I read this book. And I understand why, like, I understand why Joe Rogan likes, likes this book. And, and is always like, read this book, read this book, read this book. Because like you said, I just don't think people really understand how gnarly Comanches were. Like, and until you read this book, like you don't really understand the gnarly lifestyle of a Comanche. And like, people are like, <laughs> I mean, the internet right now is full of bros that are like, warrior lifestyle. I live the warrior way. Yeah, you know, I wake up every morning a warrior, and like, bruh, I don't want anything to do with that warrior way if it's the Comanche way. <laughs> like, that's a, that's yeah. a, that's no, a seriously. brutal. That is a brutal lifestyle, and so I understand why Joe likes it. Like, I get, yeah. it. I get it. And I think there's a bunch of feel uh, like, fake bros you know, out there that need to read this, this book. Is, <laughs> yeah, I also think like, uh. Again, maybe it's because we grew up in Alaska and our focus with, you know, Native Americans was very focused on uh, Native Alaskans. But, like, dude, I never even heard about the Comanches. Like, I had heard about the Sioux. And I talked about this at the beginning. But, like, the, I feel like the same people who, um, you know, talk about how this book is racist and how we shouldn't talk about it in that light and everything, like... I feel like maybe the reason why I hadn't heard about the Comanches is because it is a little bit of a inconvenient uh, tr tribe uh, when they're trying to paint them. The, which he talks about in the book with like the people who are trying to assimilate and say that, oh, they, they're they peaceful as long as you don't attack them. Uh, those people were very far away from the plains. And the farther away you got from the plains, the more they believed that. It's like kind of that same concept of like, you can't really make an argument of they are just peaceful people when you learn about the history and the customs of the Apaches and the, and the Comanches. And I had never even heard about them. I had just heard about the Seminole and the Pawnee and, you know, all of these ones that weren't as warlike as the Comanche was. Cause that was what the Comanches did. They hunted, they raided and they owned the plains. Like that's what they did, you know? And it's, pretty sick from a historical perspective but it's pretty sad and pretty gruesome yeah and it is like you said it, it's almost like an inconvenient truth like it's hard to paint the picture of like the living off the land indian who is mostly peaceful outside of you know protecting my family and my land i mean this was a group of people that these were the people you were protecting your family and your land from, you know, like these were the gnarly people that came in and was like, this is mine now. And if you don't want it, then I will put a burning hot coal on your chest and watch it burn through your chest. Have fun. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like that is pretty gnarly. And so, yeah, I, again, it's an inconvenient part of history for people who are like, no, that's, that's not the native American. That's not the native Americans I grew up learning about, you know, and it's, and it, it's just, it's the truth though. That that's who they were. Dude. But, uh, you know, the same thing could be said about like, uh, you know, the, the American history that I learned in elementary school is very different from the reality of which that happened. Right. It's like but the Americans were also doing hor like morally objectively horrible things all the way through. So it's like, it's just the more you learn about history, the more you realize like, ah, okay, these people are fallible. They did things that are wrong. You know, we have to look at them in their context or whatever, but there are things that are morally wrong, like objectively morally wrong. And, you know, we can learn from that, but it's yeah. not a race specific problem. Like there, like it's a, it's, right. a, it's a people problem. It's a people's <laughs> anywhere, yeah. anywhere there are people on any part of the planet. If you dig into their history, you will find that there are people who just are, are, are crazy people, you know, that do crazy things and are mean to other people and take advantage of people. And, um, and that, that's true. No matter, no matter what side of what planet you come from, of the planet you come from anywhere on the planet that, that, that will be true. And so, yeah, like you said, People try to hide that to paint themselves and, you know, paint others in, into a light. But this book definitely didn't hold punches in that regard. Mm -hmm. So what did you think of the remote podcast? Was it something that you felt like went well? 
I'll have to see when it's all edited together because a couple, yeah, I mean, a couple they, times the, the the sound would like buzz out a little bit. So I'm kind of hoping that in post I can fix that. But other than that, I felt like it went pretty well. Like there's not a huge lag. There's a little bit of a lag on my end. So hopefully, yeah, it's like one or two seconds. So it's not, I don't know. It's like, I don't know. It's like a weird Zoom call type issue. But I think what it did make me do is make sure that I wasn't interrupting, which is a good thing to learn, even though everyone listening to it will listen to this and be like, dude, he interrupts Brandon all the time. So I need to work on that. But anyway, no, it'll be good. Hopefully we can do a couple more. I'm going to try to get this one all put together this weekend and then we'll have to see, see how it turns out. And if it turns out well, we can do a couple more. You can sign up for a couple more books read crime and punishment before next weekend i don't even yeah. know dude i i like mapped out how much i'm gonna have to read this week crime and punishment is gonna be rough that's a 25 hour book and i have to finish it before monday next week so that one's gonna be i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to crush through that one but then then i've got a little bit of a couple short ones coming up so it shouldn't be too bad I am going to start reading more and listening to less podcasts just cause like I was listening to a lot of podcasts and I feel like a lot of them got like repetitive. Uh, there are still like the staple ones that I'll, I'll listen to, but like the repetitive ones, I think I'm just going to listen to more infrequently and then just read more books. So I'm hoping to do like, once I'm done taking this dumb test, um, I'm hoping to do like two to three books a month. What I have noticed shooting for is I still listen to the same amount of podcasts. I actually still listen to quite a few podcasts. Um, what's changed for me personally is I watch a lot less TV and movies. And it's because before reading books, I think I would, I'd rewatch a lot of TV shows and rewatch movies. And I still rewatch the office because the office is the greatest TV show ever made. But outside of that, I spend a lot more time reading than I do rewatching things. So like that's what I was able to kind of cut out of my life and add add reading with. And for somebody who used to make fun of people for reading, and I used to be like, readings for losers. Um, I can't believe that I didn't read more growing up. Like I I it actually kind of makes me sad because I, I truly at this point can say like, I, I thoroughly enjoy reading and I feel like I've learned so much and I've actually yeah, grown, grown as an individual. Cool now. What? You see, you're cool now. So you, when you read, when you're, when you're a kid, you're a loser. <laughs> That's true. And now that you're cool, now, now it's I, okay to read. Now, but like now you need I to get read. to your cool phase. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I, kidding. I, I mean, that's how what I thought, honestly, growing up. So it makes sense. But but yeah, like I've I've really really enjoyed reading. It's been it's been really fun. So I'm excited for all the books that I've got on my book on my list this year. It's it's a huge variety of books. So we'll have to we'll have to see how this all comes together. Maybe you can hop on a few more, especially after your te- yeah, after your test is sure. over. But all right. Well, thanks for. Uh, Thanks for doing the remote podcast with me. I'm going to go ahead and end this and see how make watch us get through all of this. And then it'd be like, didn't record properly and nothing is stored. I'd be so sad. Uh, so oh. we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. Thanks. Th- oh, wait, I have to do my outro. So for all of you that are still listening to this longer episode of the podcast, um, <laughs> Make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe if you're listening on YouTube. And if you are on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere else the podcasts are um, are listened to, please leave us a five-star review and tell your friends about the podcast. And also check us out on Instagram. We started posting reels this week, like I said we would a month ago, but we actually started this week. And they're actually pretty good, I will say. Some of them are kind of funny. I think we have a funny one coming in tomorrow. And in case you haven't listened to the podcast and don't know this, The Office is my favorite TV show of all time. So there are quite a few Office reels coming through the pipeline. So if you like the show, you'll like our Instagram. 
So check us out on Instagram as well. And that's it for the Blackwood Podcast. We'll see you next week. And next week's book is Crime and Punishment. That's right. Oof. I'm excited to read it, but it's going to be a rough week. So we'll see you then.